the layer of white snow is all that illuminates the dark of night and it crunches underneath her feet as she approaches the grey wooden villa on top of the hill. She thinks about the text message she received earlier. The first one is a must, the second is to show your love. It's a message directly from God and she knows what she has to do. She pulls out the revolver a Smith & Wesson 36 one as she gets close to the porch. The door is missing its handle and she pushes it open. She's been living in this house for three years and quickly finds her way upstairs in the dark towards her first victim. On this cold January night, Sarah Svensson would shoot two people in the small congregational village of Knutby on direct orders from God. Suspiciously, God's commands are sent to her via text message from her pastor Helge Fosmo, and the victims are the pastor's wife and the husband of his new mistress. Chapter 1 In the Beginning Genesis 1 1 Sora Marie Svensson was born on April 7, 1977, in Vagerid, Sweden, part of the Swedish Bible Belt. She was an only child and her mother passed away when she was 11, so she was raised by her father. Being described as a gentle and warm spirit and as somebody that was always eager to help. She studied nursing and after high school she worked with disabled children before attending a Bible school in Knutby, Sweden, after meeting their pastor, Elsa Valdau. In October 1999, she would join the Knutby congregation, a Pentecostal church with some more modern teachings. She was given the task of performing intercessionary prayer, meaning praying on somebody else's behalf. It's while doing this that she would meet the other pastor in this congregation, Helge Fosmo. Helge Arnold Fosmo was born July 27, 1971, in Kristinehamn, Sweden. He was the youngest of five siblings, and his parents originally came from Norway. His family wasn't very religious, but Fosmo would join the Mission Covenant Church of Sweden's youth group. And there, at the age of 12, he was saved. In 1988, at the age of 17, Fosmo would meet the woman that would be his wife, Helene while working at a cafe for Christian youth. He also became a youth pastor while studying at university to become a science teacher. In 1993, Fosmo met Pastor Valdau for the first time and he was immediately awestruck by her. She recalls him saying that this was the first time he had ever listened to what a female pastor has had to say. They would meet several more times while she was giving sermons at his church and in 1997, Fusmo, his wife and their two baby boys would relocate to Knutby where he also starts to work as a pastor. His style of preaching is unorthodox, possibly because of his non-religious upbringing and he speaks candidly and frankly about taboo subjects like sex and about death not as something to be afraid of but something to look forward to. It's like coming home. Vad är du rädd för? Vad kan hända? Ja, det absolut värsta som kan hända det är att du dör. Det är väl inte det värsta, det är väl det bästa som kan hända? Absolut värsta som kan hända är att du inte kommer till ditt hemland. Vad gör det om du dör? Om du vet att du har ett hemland. Är vi på väg hem? Ja, vi är på väg hem. Vill vi hem? Ja, vad vi vill hem. While acting the part of moral authority, Fosmo, however, has several extramarital affairs, of which his wife, Helene, ultimately becomes suspicious. Fosmo would complain to Valdau, one of the women with whom he was having an affair, that his wife is cold and distant and depressed at home, but she acts totally different around people. On the morning of December 18, 1999, Fosmo and his wife both wake up with the stomach flu. It's been going around the village and several others have already been infected. Helene throws up and comes back to bed feeling extremely weak. And after they both lay in bed for a while, 
their nanny comes up with breakfast, and even though they're sick, they still try to eat something and drink some lukewarm Coca-Cola. Fosmo then manages to fall asleep, but is awakened by a neighbor, Samuel Frankner, who comes by to check on them. He asks if Helene is in the shower, and Fosmo goes to check but finds the door locked and Helene not answering when he calls out for her. He runs to get a screwdriver and breaks open the door. Inside, he finds his wife face down in the tub, bleeding from her head. His screams and cries alert several neighbors and they quickly come to his aid and perform CPR on his wife. But it's too late and Helene Fosmo is dead at the age of 27, leaving behind three children, two boys and a girl. When examined, the cause of death is determined to be drowning, aided by a blow to the head and a high dose of dextroproxifene, a powerful painkiller. So, if you were paying close attention in the beginning, you'd see that this is not the wife from the intro. This is his first wife, who uh, died mysteriously. So the question is, did he kill his first wife? And the answer is, maybe. He was eventually tried um, for her death, but he was found not guilty. There was just not enough evidence. So I'm going to go through some of the circumstances surrounding the death of his first wife, and you can tell me if you think he did it or not. First off, the dextroproxifene was prescribed to him, and it was a lethal dose, meaning she would have died even without the blow to the head or the drowning. Um, they tried putting it in Coca-Cola, crushing it up, but they would taste awful, so there is no way she could have ingested it without her knowledge, meaning either he gave it to her or she took it herself. He also forged the autopsy report when he was giving it to her parents. He removed the mention of the dextroproxifene. And when questioned about this, he said that it was because he didn't want the parents to know that she killed herself because suicide is a sin. He also got rid of her stuff basically immediately. Uh, before she was even buried, he uh, had packed up all of her stuff and given it away to charity. And within two, three months, he had already found somebody new who was living with him. On the other hand, he, from witness testimony, seems more genuinely upset as compared to later testimony when his second wife was found dead. He also doesn't have a life insurance policy on her, and he has real trouble paying the bills after she dies. As we shall see later, he's not the smartest guy, he's very conniving and manipulative. But he's smart enough to know that if you take a person away from the household, there's going to be some money troubles. So I think that sort of speaks a little bit in his favor. Now the prosecution's theory is that he gave her the dextroproxifene in some manner. They, de they don't specify it. And then he waits for her to go into the shower where he follows her. He takes her and hits her head against the faucet and then he drowns her. Now to me, man, what do I know? I, I, I know nothing. Uh, it just seems needlessly complicated for him to poison his wife and then assault her and then drown her to then go out and lock the bathroom door and then go to bed and wait for a neighbor to randomly show up and wake him up and then find her. A much easier sort of series of events would be he just gives her the dextroproxifene, says that it's medicine for her stomach flu, and he waits for her to OD, but she decides to take a shower and then she slips and falls and hits her head and drowns. The defense theory is that she took the dextroproxifene herself because she wanted to kill herself. Now that's possible. Or maybe she took them and she took an overdose by accident. Also possible. There's really no way of knowing. It's, it's not clear-cut by any means. If you were to push me on it, though, I'd say, yeah, I think he gave her the overdose and told her it was medicine. I think that that's the most likely scenario. So, what do you guys think? Kill her? Didn't kill her. All right, back to the story. In the months leading up to his wife's death, Fosmo has developed a close relationship with Valdau's little sister, Alexandra, and he tells Valdau that he's had dreams of him and Alexandra getting married. She does not like this, probably in part because her and Fosmo are having an affair, but she can do nothing to stop the couple. Alexandra, only 20 years old, would move in with Fosmo in the spring of 2000. 
only months after the death of his first wife. Chapter 2 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Only months after Alexandra moved in, Fosmo starts grooming the 23-year-old Sara Svensson to be his next lover. Fosmo is counseling Sara and her husband because their marriage is on the rocks. But it soon becomes evident to Sara's husband that Fosmo is taking her side in every argument. She in turn lets it slip that all the feelings she is supposed to have for her husband, she has for Fosmo. He cracks a big smile in the middle of the therapy session when he hears this. They also work closely together performing intercessionary prayer, and Fosmo makes it clear how he feels about her. And if she should feel the same way, then that is the will of God. He also wants her to perform acts with him as part of the intercessionary prayer. The acts he's talking about are sexual. But it's not about sexual gratification, he says. It's about sending a message to God. And in mid-April 2000, Fosmo and Sora have sex for the first time. In the same period, he would ask Sora for the first of many times if she is willing to kill if God asked her to, like Abraham was willing to kill Isaac. She reluctantly said she would, but thinks that God can fight his own battles. For the rest of the year, Fosmo continues to have a sexual relationship with both Sora and Valda while preaching on a wide variety of religious topics, for instance, the role of women. Och samma Gud säger till kvinnorna, nu får du sluta vara en manhaftig feminist. Det betyder att mannen bestämmer över dig. Kan vi få ett kvinnligt amen? Mannen bestämmer över dig. Ja. Du ska villigt och glatt säga, ja herre, herre med litet hår. Du har en herre i himmelen och du som är gift har en herre på jorden som är din man. He's well read in the Bible and is seen by the congregation as a man closer to God than the rest of them. One incident is especially convincing. In the spring of 2001, Fosmo predicts that he will become violently ill and hospitalized. And just months later, that prediction would come true. He is committed to the hospital with a high fever and is severely ill. He requests that Sara, not his wife, stay by his side as he is fighting this spiritual battle. And against Sara's husband's wishes, she stays with him in the hospital for days. This prediction of illness silences the last of those who would doubt the pastor's powers of premonition and connection to God. If you listen to Helga Fosmo's uh, preachings, it's, I mean, it's not very good. But there is a couple of reasons why I think he was so convincing. The, the first is obviously his predictions. He had dreams and visions, he claimed. Um, and then those predictions would come true. And that automatically made people feel like he was tapped into to something higher. He also had a very matter-of-fact way of talking about things. See, uh, Sweden has this jantelagen, which is basically an idea of humility. You should be humble. You shouldn't think that you're anything special. So if you would have somebody like a... a like an American televangelist preacher. They're way too bombastic for a Swedish audience. But Helge Fosmo would talk about things, as I said, in a very matter-of-fact way. And part of being a Pentecostal is to believe in things like demons and angels and miracles and that those occur in your everyday life. So he, let's say he had a scratch on his arm and somebody asked him about it, he would say, well, it was a spiritual battle with a demon. He would talk about it the way you would talk about doing laundry or eating breakfast. And I think that was very palatable for the congregation. Now, whether or not he actually believed that he was having these spiritual battles is anybody's guess. Anyway, those are just some of the reasons why I think Helge Fosma was so convincing as a preacher. After recovering in the hospital, he is sent home in June of 2001. But he is adamant that his spiritual struggle is not over, and he says that the only way to move forward is for Sora to move in with him. And she does. She moves into the bedroom with Fosmo, 
and his wife, Alexandra, moves into the guest room. Every night they have sex to fight the spiritual battle of good and evil, and although the rest of the congregation knows that Saha lives there, they have no idea what the spiritual battle entails, and they think that she's mostly just a nanny. Between 2001 and 2003, Sora divorces her husband and continues to live with Fosmo. He in turn receives an anonymous email stating that there is a new woman made especially for him. It's Sora. But when he brings this up with the elders of the congregation, they reject this. In turn, Fosmo would cut her off more and more from the rest of the congregation. He also starts telling her that she is a sinner, that she is filth in the eyes of God, and that she has to repent in order to be saved and avoid hell. But he says despite all this, Fosmo still loves her. She is in effect being brainwashed for years to think that God has rejected her and she must prove herself worthy of his love in order to enter heaven. He lets the congregation know that she was the one who tempted him with her sinful ways, but she still continues to live at his villa and in secret they continue their sexual relationship. In early November 2003, she receives an anonymous text message. It says, with a literal interpretation, that she must kill Fosmo's wife, Alexandra. When she confronts Fosmo and asks if he sent the message, he is so infuriated and his denial is so strong that she believes him. But he says that this is what he's predicted. He's been having dreams and premonitions about his wife being sent home for months. And then he suggests that Sora should kill his wife with a hammer. Chapter 3 For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 29 11. Sora initially refuses, but the text messages persist, saying that this is a message from God about his plan and her way to salvation. Sometimes the messages come from Fosmo's own cell phone number. He explains this by saying that the message was sent to him from God and he just forwards them. He also prompts and pushes her in person by saying she should not deny God's plan, that she is a disgusting sinner and that she will burn in hell if she refuses. On November 8, 2003, Sora attacks a sleeping Alexandra with a hammer and strike her several times in the head. But Alexandra wakes up during the attack and manages to fight her off. The murder attempt has failed. As a result, Fosmo banishes Sora from the parish and from Knutby and she leaves the very same day. But the family decides not to file a police report, so the only ones who know about it are themselves and some of the members of the congregation. In the months leading up to the November 8 murder attempt, a new woman, Annette Linde, the next door neighbor, would sometimes take Sora's place in the bedroom, while Sora sleeps on the couch and his wife in the guest room. Linde cannot stay the night, however, because she has her husband Daniel waiting for her at home. After being banished from Knutby, Sora moves in with her father back in Vagirid, where she grew up but the text messages from God persists. She is lamented for failing to execute God's plan and condemned to hell. Fosmo would also call from his own phone and send text messages pressuring her to go through with the plan, pushing her to buy a gun. He says repeatedly that it's God's plan that his wife be sent home and the only way to be rewarded with salvation and eternal life in paradise is to go through with it. In mid-December, a new name shows up in the text messages. A second person now needs to be sent home. Fosmo's neighbor, Daniel Linde. After months of pressure, Sora gives in, and after buying a gun in Stockholm, she puts her murderous plan into action on January 10th, 2004. At 1.30 a.m., Fosmo calls Sora's cell phone to say that there's still movement in the village and to ask where she is. She is driving her father's black Volvo 345 and is still a ways away from Knutby. At 3.30 a.m., Fosmo calls again, 
this time to inquire about how she feels and to tell her that the coast is clear. She says she feels anxious and afraid, but lets him know that she is almost there. The call lasts 12 minutes. Around 4 a.m., she parks a car at a turnaround about 500 yards from Fosmo's villa. She disguises herself by putting pantyhose with eye cutouts over her face and puts the kind of blue shoe protection you can find at a hospital on her shoes. She's bought a size 38, one size bigger than a regular, to throw off police. She begins trudging through the deep snow in the dark of night and 15 minutes later she arrives at the house. She goes around back and enters. The door handle is broken after a fight between Fosmo and his wife the day before and she makes her way in first through the laundry room and then up the stairs. She first passes the two boys bedroom and then the daughter's room. In her hand she has a revolver with a homemade silencer as she enters the master bedroom. She only sees Alexandra asleep in the bed. She doesn't know where Fosmo is. She walks closer to make sure that it's really Alexandra before raising the revolver and firing the first shot. She hits Alexandra in the hip and she lets out a faint scream. Saw quickly closes the distance and fires two more shots at close range into Alexandra's head. She then turns around and walks down the stairs. When she's almost out of the house, she's overcome with anxiety. What if she's not dead? She runs back upstairs to check and while in the bedroom she lifts the covers to see Alexandra's limp body with a hole in her temple and the bed filled with blood. She hears a soft gargling and holds her breath fearing that Alexandra is still alive, but the gargling is just bubbles from a nearby aquarium. Alexandra is dead. The first part of God's plan is complete. She heads outside and begins to walk to Linda's house. She takes the back way near the field to avoid being spotted. It only takes her a couple of minutes to walk to the nearby house. Their back door is locked and she breaks it down and enters their home. Annette is not at home this night and Donya is asleep alone in the master bedroom on the first floor. She makes her way to it, but the door is locked. Filled with doubt, she walks outside and calls Fosmo at 4.32 a.m. He answers and tells her to just knock on the bedroom door. He also tells her that the shots were not very loud. She's surprised. She didn't know he was home but he was in the boy's bedroom, hearing his wife be murdered. She hangs up after talking for one minute and 54 seconds. Then she walks back inside and with a pillow in one hand and the gun in the other, she knocks on the door. After knocking a few times, she hears movement on the other side. She hears a click and the door swings open. Daniel is standing right in front of her. He sees what he thinks is a man with a sock over his head for a mask, pointing a gun at his chest. He hears a loud bang. Sora points the gun at his face and fires again. His right ear starts to hurt and he thinks it's because of the sound. But he's been shot in the face and the bullet stops in his neck one centimeter from his carotid artery. He falls backwards, flat on his back. She turns around and runs outside but is immediately struck with the same anxiety. What if he's still alive? She turns around to head inside to make sure, but then she sees the lights in the house turn on. Somebody else is awake. Daniel and his wife share the home with another family, the Franknos, and they are awakened by the shots. Sara turns around and runs into the dark night. Inside, there is a frenzy of activity going on. Daniel is still alive and Samuel Frankner is quickly at his side trying to understand what has happened. Daniel picks up his cell phone and despite being shot in the face and the chest manages to call 112 at 441 a.m. When he is unable to speak Samuel takes over the phone after calling and texting several members of the congregation, among them Fosmo who runs over there. Meanwhile, Sora is back in her car and she texts Fosmo that she's been sick. It's code to let him know the deed is done, but he doesn't get the text. He switched off his phone. 
After sending it, she speeds off around the same time that the police and ambulances arrive in the little village where nothing ever happens. A crowd of people have gathered outside Danya's house and he's carried out on a stretcher. He is loaded into the ambulance and the caring pastor decides to go with him for moral support. But before they leave, Danya describes his attacker to the police, a masked man of average build. Fosmo then tells Samuel to go to his house and wake up Alexandra to tell her what has happened. Nobody yet knows that Fosmo's wife has also been shot. At 5.07 a.m., roadblocks are set up by police and just one minute later, they stop a black Volvo 345 with a young woman driving. But since they're looking for a male suspect, Sora is allowed to leave. Meanwhile, Samuel, along with another woman from the congregation, knock on Alexandra's bedroom door. When she doesn't answer, they walk in and when they try to shake her awake, their hands are covered in blood. They quickly get on the phone to those still at Donia's house to tell the police to get over there. There has been another shooting and this victim is already dead. One of the police officers is immediately suspicious. He was the one who responded when the pastor's first wife was found dead in the same house just four years earlier. Chapter 4 Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Acts 3.19 Before Fosmo arrives at the hospital in Uppsala, he is already a suspect. It is falsely reported by one of the EMTs that he has got a gun in the ambulance. It turns out to be a cell phone. But when the police arrive at the hospital to take him to the interrogation room, he shows them a different one. The phone the EMT saw is gone, and it is never recovered. The police interrogate Fosmo as a witness, and they ask him about the shooting of Daniel. After a long conversation, the police decide to let Fosmo know that his wife has been found dead. He breaks down and cries when he hears this, but he seems to quickly recover and immediately point the finger at Sora as the most likely suspect. He tells them about her attack on his wife with a hammer two months earlier. The police send out an APB on Sora and release Fosmo, but the suspicions remain. They have nothing tangible, but his grief doesn't seem real, and two of his wife dying violently raises some serious red flags. The police decide to put wiretaps on his phone while they look for Sora. She is located the next day at her father's house in Vagirid. When confronted, she initially denies involvement, but when they take her to the police station, she confesses in the first few minutes of the first interrogation. She says, I did it, and I did it alone, and nobody prompted me or helped me. Her being this adamant about being the sole perpetrator raises even more suspicions with the investigating officers. The wiretap on Fosmo's phone uncovers loving text messages every day between him and Linda. She also complains about having to go to the hospital to visit her critically wounded husband. And Fosmo, in turn, complains about the cost of a funeral, even with the insurance policy he has on his wife. Ja, sen var jag på begravningsbyrån idag förresten. <coughs> Bara Fornus insats i det här är 15 300. Uh-huh. <laughs> Känns jätteroligt. Uh-huh. Sen tillkommer då hyra av lokal, hyra av lokal för minnesstund, förtäring på minnesstund, blommor. Uh-huh. Eh, så det är 20-25 000 för begravningen sen tillkommer gravsten. <laughs> alltså vad dyrt det är att dö. <laughs> ja, det är ju det. Men det, jo, det, det lärde jag mig av förgång, för Helene och jag hade ju inga försäkringar. Another taped conversation between Fosmo and a man in the congregation prompts police to take Fosmo and Linde into custody. Fosmo asks the man that the congregation pray that they don't find evidence linking him, Linde or Valdau to the murder and attempted murder. Det här polisen håller på med nu då? Ja. Det handlar ju om att hitta en anstiftare. Ja. Vilket gör att Sara är, inte är skyldig utan är ett offer. Okej. Okay. Eh, och det är så typiskt djävulen. För då är det ja. gott fel. Det är därför man börjar fråga om vår kvinnosyn. Det är därför man börjar fråga om vår slutenhet. Och, och det ena efter det andra. Ja. 
Eh, och jag känner bara så här. Eh, vi måste varje dag intensivt eh, be emot den ande som vill vända detta till att bli en anklagelse. Vilket är mot mig personligen, mot Nettan, mot Tirsa eller mot församlingen som helhet. Mm. För det, det går ut på samma sak. Precis som människor i alla tider har tyckt synd om Judas Iskario. <laughs> ja. Liksom, för det var ju Guds fel för någon var tvungen att göra typ. Ja. Um. During the first interrogation, Fosmo is confronted with the fact that Sara has called him in the middle of the attack, something he cannot explain, so he initially denies this. The police recover a few text messages from Sara's cell phone, but she has erased most of them and continue to claim that she was alone. Some of the messages are from Fosmo's cell phone number, but he explains the nature of these messages as summaries of religious discussions about specific Bible verses they've had together and says that he hopes that these messages didn't inspire her to murder. There are also some messages from an unknown number. Saw claims that these are messages from God, but the police are naturally suspicious. After a few weeks of investigation, the police get a call from an old friend of Saw's who wants to act as a character witness for her. As she is about to hang up, she asks the police if they have Sara's old number. She explains that she would always call Sara on this number, but in the middle of September of 2003, Sara stopped answering it, and when she called, Fusmo picked up and explained that Sara wasn't using this number anymore. When she gives it to the investigators, it's the same number that sent the text messages from God. The police compare the movement of Fusmo's cell phone with God's number, and over the last few months, they're always in the same place. Sora is shocked when confronted with the new evidence, and slowly but surely, over the course of six months, begin to tell the whole story. It's like a spell has been broken, and she comes out of her trance. She recalls hundreds of text messages, but since they're all deleted, it's her word against his. That is until two weeks before trial, when the police with the help of a computer company, are able to recover the deleted messages. And there are thousands, and they paint a horrific but clear picture of manipulation and brainwashing. In 2004, Helge Fosmo is convicted of solicitation of murder and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. Sara Svensson is convicted of murder and attempted murder but was found mentally ill at the time and sentenced to an indefinite stay at a mental institution. Now there are some psychologists who think that Helge Fosmo should also have gotten the same sentence as Sara. That he was so wrapped up in this delusion that he really believed that his wife was going to die and that that was God's will. See, the insanity defense is based upon the fact that you can't tell right from wrong. You think that you're actually doing a good thing. And that was what Saul was doing. She believed that this was God's will. She believed that this was the right thing to do, even though it felt like the wrong thing to do. And the second she was questioned, she admitted to it. She said, this was God's will, and that's why I did it. The difference is that, to this day, Fosmo has never confessed to anything. He still denies having any involvement at all with the murder and the murder attempt. The evidence is pretty overwhelming, and if you really believe that what he was doing was the right thing to do and that it was really God's will, you would have just said so. The fact that he's lying means that he knows what he did was wrong, and we know what he did was wrong, and he's trying to convince us that he didn't do it at all. He's not insane. Well, he might be completely fucking crazy, but he's not insane, and he may have fooled some... Uh, Psychologist, but you're not fooling me, boy. Sara Svensson was released in 2011. Helge Fosmo has been granted parole and is scheduled to be released in 2021.